Pat Basher, Mohawk Valley Water Authority. Okay, so the comptroller's audit is out on the uh, the water authority, and uh, boy, forty three percent of the water is unaccounted for. What uh, what what are your thoughts on this? Well, one, I, you know, it's no surprise. I mean, we have uh, very comprehensive financial reports that we put out every year, and we've always included those figures. We never tried to hide it. Yeah. Um, and everybody knows that we it's an older system. We get water main breaks almost every day. Last winter, uh, we were getting water main breaks five and six a day. The frost line was down six feet. It was wreaking havoc with the system. And w- what we're seeing here in our area is really not unusual compared to the rest of upstate and, and a lot of older cities in New England. We're no different than Syracuse or Albany. Uh, you know, they're right on par with us. And it's really a factor of, you know, having a piping system where a third of our pipes are more than 100 years old. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we do what we can, but we've employed all kinds of technologies to find leaks faster. We listen underground on the pipes. We try to find the leaks before they break the surface. And uh, we're doing a lot of proactive maintenance. But the bottom line is all that technology can help us find these leaks faster, but it's not going to stop the water main breaks from happening. And so the way you do that really is either outright replacement of water mains or we do uh, rehabilitation of mains, which means we clean the inside, we line it. That's also very expensive. So just just to give you an idea, replacing one mile of pipe is more than nine hundred thousand dollars. Wow! And we have uh, we have you know seven hundred miles of pipe in the system. So we you know we could spend two hundred million dollars and maybe reduce that leakage in half. And and you know the fact is that if we tried to do that, we would have annual debt payments of more than twelve million dollars a year just in debt mm-hmm. to save two to three hundred thousand dollars of cost of the leakage, which is extra chemical treatment and things like that. So yeah, right. you know we do everything we can, but it's just it's an old system, and frankly, unless somebody wants to dump a couple hundred million dollars in our lap, you know the best we can do is just be proactive, um, you know, constantly uh, employ the best methods and the best practices and just keep the system moving the best we can and the best that the community can right. afford it. But, Pat, is there a possibility that people, that customers, residents, are dumping a couple hundred bucks a year on leaks that are happening? I know that in many of the homes that you've installed, those digital things that measure the water that's in the house or coming into the house to make sure that it's not leaking once it gets to the home. But is there a possibility that the water is leaking from the street up until that point and residents are paying for it? Well, there are situations where somebody will call us with a, a very high bill, and sometimes it's leaking after their meter inside their house. If it's leaking between the street and their house, that's not going through their meter, so they're not paying for it. But nevertheless, it's one of those leaks that we try to have. You know, we we try to find them. We try yeah. to notify the customer if it's that's their, their responsibility, property. though, right? I mean, uh, your house to the to the middle of the street is your responsibility. Yeah, and yeah. so some of this leakage isn't always on our own piping system. It's customer leaks on their service line. I, I don't understand why, why people are saying, am I paying for it? Your meter is in your house. So right. uh, the meter, the water comes to the meter, and if if you're wasting water, then it is it has to be, as long as these meters are authentic uh, and precise, it has to be your leak would be inside your house, and that would be your responsibility. I, I guess That's the correct. water yeah. from the from the main line to the meter would never be registered. But we've had calls from people. We may who be say, paying for it in taxes, mm-hmm. but um, I, uh, or in rates per se. But per your metered water, uh, you wouldn't be paying for that. And are those digital meters in every single home in your jurisdiction? Um, we're getting there. All the meters in the system have been uh, replaced fairly frequently, uh, and so we have just uh, about 2,000 meters left that we have to actually change out because they're older style meters. But we have about 39,000 meters in the system. Out of those, they're all newer technology as far as the meter down in the basement goes and an electronic register that measures the water. What's newer now is we're up to about 24,000 or so out of the 39,000 that are now connected to radio modems. And what those radio modems do is they send in a signal every single night, and they give us a packet of 24 hourly readings. And so when someone calls us up and says, gee, my bill went up, if they have one of those modems, we can then look at their account, and we can see hour by hour right through the night if there's water being registered through the meter. Then we can tell them that they may have a leak, uh, there's a toilet that might be leaking, something to that effect. And so that helps us cut down a lot of that wasted water that we end up, you know, in a dispute with the customer, and very often, you know, we end up granting some sort of forgiveness under a program. And so um, all of that will begin to eventually lower the amount that's, you know, quote, unaccounted for 
even though we pretty much know where it's going and why it's happening. So the, the uh, thing, yeah, go oh, ahead. Sorry, Bill, go ahead. Well, I, I was going to say that um, uh, I'm, I'm hearing this, and it's not just from here but in other parts of the country, where the, in defense of losing the water, they're saying, well, it seeps back into the ground and ultimately we retrieve it uh, the, the natural way. I mean, is there... I mean, is well, there any we, legitimacy we to that? We don't retrieve it as a water system because our water source is up north of Hinkley. But right. what does happen is anything that's leaking does end up in the groundwater. It does get eventually into the Mohawk River. It's usable for the canal system, which means that, you know, there's perhaps less they'd have to pull out of Hinkley Reservoir to maintain right. the canal system. But it does eventually end up back in the overall water, uh, you know, macro environment in the yep. area here. That's true. But it doesn't get back in our pipes. Well, if you're there and your neighbor across the street is uh, not watering his lawn or in the middle of an August drought and you look over there and you're like, why is that guy's grass so green? <laughs> um, uh, chances are uh, that pipe somewhere way under the ground is uh, is leaking. Forty three percent, though, is a big number. And yeah. this this goes back to uh, this aging infrastructure that um Boy, I mean, this is a, a really going to be a tough nut to crack, but it's something that's going to have to be taken care of because it's not just water lines, right? Gas lines and everything else. We are an old infrastructure here. Yeah, you know, I can't, I can't speak for uh, the gas companies. I don't know what, how their systems – I mean, generally speaking, they're not down as deep. It's, it's easier to fix them, and a lot of areas are using plastic lines. But, you know, for our system here on the water – uh, it is an old system. I will say, though, that the period that was looked at in this particular report really encompassed two winters. And, you know, we have a lot more breaks in the winter typically than we do in the summertime. So yeah. it did look at sort of our worst-case scenario. It, you know, you could pick a different period of months and end up with somewhat of a different picture. Right. But the fact is that, you know, there's been uh, high leakage in the system for a very long time, decades and decades, and we're doing everything we can to stay ahead of it. But it just comes down to public policy. How much can the community afford for outright replacement and major, major right. capital okay. investments? And so far, we've put $55 million into the system for improvements since we took the system over in 1997. All right, last, and, la last question I have here is, can Flint happen here? I mean, our pipes have to be older than uh, than the pipes in Michigan. Uh, can Flint happen here? No, and and the reason why I say that is because we have uh, very tested chemistry in place. It's called corrosion control. What that does is it neutralizes any acidity that's in the source water up at Hinkley. The water is naturally somewhat acidic, and if it sits in a lead pipe overnight, for example, when a family's sleeping and they don't yeah. draw any water, that's when it starts to absorb some lead from the pipe. Here in our system, because we buffer the water and neutralize the pH with uh, soda ash and lime, the water doesn't absorb that lead because it's fairly neutral when it's sitting in that pipe. And that system has been in place now for more than two decades. So we, we do constant testing for lead. We have a regular schedule that's uh, in place set by EPA and the New York State Health Department. We follow it carefully, and our lead levels are down where they're supposed to be. As long as we continue to do the corrosion control, yeah. that's not a problem. And based on the uh, the number of, uh, of, of don't-drink-the-water alerts uh, that we have in, uh, in this area, um, you guys aren't afraid of saying, hey, there's a problem with the water right now, don't drink it, whereas it seems out there they try to cover it up. Well, I think they try to cover it up, but also people should understand when there's a boil water advisory in effect here, more often than not, it's strictly because it's required by the health department. If we have a water main break that lasts more than four hours or we hit zero pressure in the main because we have to do a shutoff, we have to issue that. It's mandatory language as a precaution just in case any groundwater seeped into the mains. And as we flush after we repair it, right. you know, there's, I guess, some risk that there could be some uh, background bacteria in the water. So we're always required to issue that. But, um, you know, 99 times out of 100, when we test it, we do two samples at, at the 24-hour mark and the 48-hour mark. We don't find anything in the water. We lift the boil water advisory. It's strictly a precaution. So yeah. it doesn't mean the water is necessarily dangerous, but we are required to right. do that. Uh, at the end of the day, if there was ever any question of do we have enough water, if we're losing 43% of what we have, yeah. Um, uh, boy, if we could button the system up, we would uh, not have any issue right. supplying well, nano with water. To put it in perspective, yesterday the release rate through Hinkley Dam that they were letting down the creek was 660 million gallons a day compared to 7 or 8 million gallons a day that might be you know, leaking through the system. Yeah. The other thing is that the canal system itself leaks right through the locks. 
And even if they never operated any of the locks in the middle of the navigation right. season and opened and closed them, they still need to feed about 100 million gallons a day into the canal because it would run dry because it leaks right through the locks. Got it. Okay. And the amount of leakage in the canal dwarfs what we're losing through our pipes. Okay. All right, uh, Pat Besher, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Very interesting stuff and uh, something we're going to be looking at down the road, there's no doubt. My pleasure. Thanks, okay. guys.